BBC Television, 1958, and a young talent show guest gives his first TV interview. What are your two names? Yours is? James Page and... David Houseman. Oh, what are you going to do when you leave school? Take up skiffle? No, I want to do, uh, well, biological research. Do you? That never happened. Jimmy Page became a professional guitarist and the founder of Led Zeppelin. The band set the standard for 70s rock, taking music and mass audiences to a new level. But it all came to an end when their drummer, John Bonham, died suddenly and the band split. Until this one-off concert five years ago, the first full-length show since the old days, with Bonham's son Jason in his father's place. It was greeted as proof that the band could still deliver and now it's all on record in a film, Celebration Day. For Jimmy Page, still the keeper of Led Zeppelin's flame, the film is a key achievement. And one which brought him back to the BBC for a rare interview. Jimmy, when you did the um, reunion concert five years ago, did you know then that you would make a film of it? Absolutely not. Uh, at, at the time, we had this one opportunity to play. There was no warm-up gig or no follow-on gig. Um, and we put a lot of work into it to make sure that we were really fully up to speed so we could go out and show people why we had a reputation of being what we were. Um, and actually the total focus was on that one show and working towards it. However, uh, naturally we had quite a production going on and back screen projection um, and cameras that were going to relate to that and it, 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 that obviously was going to be recorded so it got to the point where we, we, we decided that it was a, a good idea to record the night because quite clearly that was going to be it and then revisit it later and see how it looked. But th that certainly wasn't the object of the exercise. I mean, that's, that's pretty unusual, isn't it? Because most people do gigs with the whole intent of putting out a DVD, but for us it wasn't that way around. So all, all the multiple cameras and so on are there to provide images uh, for, for the video backdrop. At what point do you look through the footage and say, actually, I think we could release this as a film? Well, it was a good couple of years later, two or three years later, that we did that. We needed to, I, I think in a way we needed to distance ourselves uh, that far from it, really. It was quite, a, quite uh, healthy to do that. And how did that come about? So are you all sitting around together watching it? And... Uh, eventually, yeah, the three, the three remaining members went in to see uh, the, the, the footage. And, and basically it was a rough cut of what had been showed on the screens that night. It was pretty, pretty exhilarating to see it and feel it, really, and sort of relive the memories of it. So what did, so, you, what did you feel watching it? I mean, you say exhilarated, but did you, I mean, were you kind of thinking, yeah, go on, actually, that, we did pretty well? Well, we knew we'd done pretty well, that we'd got to it relatively unscathed, because it could have been a few train wrecks, obviously. Um, but we got, got through it very well. But it was really fascinating to watch it and, watch, and see the interaction at that point. But to, to, uh, to actually, well, bring it forward to see whether, whether it would sort of hold up as being something that could be, say, shown in cinemas, but certainly a DVD, then it need, needed finessing and, uh, and the decision was made to go ahead and do that. There's a lot of close-up camera shots. Um, uh, and although you're playing to a huge arena and it's a big stage, we can see the interchange of expressions between uh, all of you. Was that the intention? Because it's almost like we, the audience, are on stage. In my time, I think the interesting thing for most people who've seen it has uh, uh, have, uh, remarked upon the fact that we sort of group 
together. You know, we're working around the drums so that we can see each other and there's this interplay because um, even though we had the structure of the numbers, we'd, we'd sort of rehearsed and routined enough that if there were any sort of changes, or for example, if Robert came in early on a verse, we can just sort of follow it. And uh, also there were areas of improvisation where you needed to sort of nod to each other to give the, the cues. And uh, yeah, that's it. It's a working band. It's creating as it's, as it's playing, as time's going on during the set. You mentioned improvisation, of course. You, you, you know, you were, Led Zeppelin was famous as a band for doing quite mm. a lot of improvisation. Can you give me some examples during that particular gig where you improvised? Well, I, I must say, since I've been loving you, was was different. For, for me, it was different in the approach to it from the rehearsals that we'd had prior to that. The structure of Since I've Been Loving You is going to be the same. The dynamics are going to be different because that's going to be how it works uh, for that particular night, if you like. It, it sort of takes it on its own momentum. But as far as the uh, solo parts of it go, the, uh, the introduction would have been totally, well, relatively different, and the solo would be different. So that, that's my area of improvisation within it. Something like six weeks of, of preparation or rehearsals went into this? Well, week, it was it? sort of over a six-week period, maybe. Well, wh why there so There was much? a lot of preparation, in actual fact. When we first did the... Um, the first rehearsal was really exciting. So I think everyone had such a will to make it work. Um, but nevertheless, we, we, we really needed to, to, to be playing properly as a band and not just sort of go through the motions of it. We really needed to throw ourselves into the whole commitment of it. And plus, um, having Jason, Jason had the hardest job of anybody as far as, well, that's my opinion anyway, because he had to fill his father's shoes and he had a lot resting on his shoulders. And of course we knew Jason as, you know, John's son. So it was always like the, the, young, the kid, the young man. But we, we needed to play in such a way that we all had the confidence with each other, no matter what. And, and that, needed, that, that needed sort of playing and, and, and getting to know each other musically, or getting to know each other again musically. I was talking to somebody the other day who's been working on the, um, on the Stones 50th anniversary gig and he was saying during the rehearsal, sometimes when they're playing really old tracks, they've forgotten them. And so they literally went and put, put a tape back on and they were all listening going, oh right, okay, that's how we do it. Did you have moments like that? Um, well, yes. Uh, in so much as I, I, uh, the numbers that we were doing, I sort of re refreshed my memory just to make sure that... This, well, actually, you see, what happened with Led Zeppelin was that once we recorded the, uh, the, the albums and if, the, if a track was selected into the set, it would start moving anyway and it would change. So you, you, it could be as best as your last recollection of how you played it or even played it since, in, you know, in a solo setup or whatever. And that goes for all three of us, Robert Plant, myself and, and John Paul Jones. Um, so, yeah, they needed, they needed maybe a little recapping, but basically we'd announce a number and then go into it, and, and, and usually we'd get through it. But something like, say, for example, For Your Life, um, that was something that, was, that we needed to just sort of recheck up the, the whole structure of it, because it was quite complicated. Can you recall exactly what you were feeling that first moment when you walk out on stage? Um, well, I knew that we'd, I knew that we'd really prepared for this. Uh, I knew that we'd invested enough time to make it really superb. The, the difference between this and any other band that you're going to, or this show and any other band that you would talk to, is the fact that we constructed a set that we felt really represented the, the, the sort of, in the retrospect of our work and the summing up of the career, if you like, under the circumstances of one concert. But we didn't have a chance to give it a run in front of an audience. So 
there, there was that thought of, well, I think, you know, I'm absolutely sure that we've got it right as far as the balance and the, and the, uh, 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 and the movement, the, the whole journey of it, if you like. Um, uh, it, and I didn't necessarily have, um, like, floods of nerves, but the adrenaline tap had really turned on and I was just really wanting to get out there and play. So that's what I felt before it. Now, you played, um, I think, 16 um, of your greatest hits. I mean, I imagine there was a lot of discussion about what you should mm. or you shouldn't play. Um, with hindsight, are any regrets, um, anything you wish had been included that wasn't? Or do you think you got it right? Not really. I think it was... Uh, uh, I mean, we didn't do an acoustic set with him. That would have sort of changed the dynamic a bit, and especially if it was a bit nervy, you know. Uh, I, I, the one thing that we... It, that we were going to do was include Stairway somewhere, you know, in the middle, two-thirds of the way through, and end with Kashmir. That, that these sort of decisions were made on the way through. I think it, I think it was a pretty good. Uh, I think I, th I think it was a pretty good representation because, uh, uh, for example, that song "For Your Life" it was re reviewed as a new song because it wasn't one that was so well known. That album "Presence" wasn't so well known, but uh, I think it was pretty good. And which song were you playing when you thought? OK, this has really come together. Well, if I tell you that on the first... the first, first couple of numbers, the monitors weren't working properly on stage. So we were... So we... we that, that, that was pretty interesting. And the fact that we got through the first two numbers, I thought, no, we'd, we've done pretty well at that point without, uh, you know, and kept it all together. And then, obviously, everything came together through the monitors. But... Uh, there, there were there were certain certainly sort of high, high points within it. Um, uh, there was a lot of it actually. I mean, a were lot, Kashmir and it. Stairway? Well, Kashmir just seemed to take on a whole ethereal energy to it. You could just feel the whole lift in yourself and in the uh, in the auditorium. However, that had been the case in some in the other numbers that preceded it as well. You know, some of the numbers that had real high points in them, but that that was just flying. We put so much work into it, we were really on a roll by the time we went in there that, that I must say that, uh, that I, know, I know this was the same for John Paul Jones and myself, the following day, we, ar around sort of two, three o'clock in the afternoon, we were really sort of pumped up because we'd paced ourselves towards doing a show and of course there wasn't a show the following night, but there we are. Washington earlier this month. Jimmy Page joined fellow Led Zeppelin members Robert Plant and John Paul Jones at the Kennedy Center Honours hosted by President Obama. The award was given in recognition of their contribution to American culture. And when the Brits initially kept their distance, Led Zeppelin grabbed America uh, from the opening court. Uh, we were ready for what Jimmy called songs with a lot of light and shade. Uh, of course, these guys also redefined the rock and roll lifestyle. We do not have video of this, <laughs> but there was some hotel rooms trashed and mayhem all around. Uh, so it's fitting that we're doing this in a room with windows that are about three inches thick. <laughs> My conversation with Jimmy took place shortly before that award ceremony, so I asked him how he felt about receiving the Kennedy Award. Well, it's a terrific honour, isn't it? Um, the, the, the fact is, all four of us were so influenced by American music and, and even the, uh, uh, and for me, the music that I was hearing in the, in the sort of 50s over here, you know, the, the uh, music of Cliff Richard, etc., and, and um, Vince Taylor, these people, it was all really, and Lonnie Donegan especially, it, it was all uh, um, a reinterpretation of what was going on in America, so we sort of, had had this American music sort of coming into us, and then we were accessing it through uh, through the radio and, and and records. So it's a major part of why we became what we were, which was musicians, and became totally seduced by this whole movement of music. And is it true that you actually bought your first guitar after hearing Elvis Presley? 
No, well, no, it's not quite like that. I always thought it, it was Baby Let's Play House. That's one of the stories. Well, that... I know, I know. We actually had a guitar in the in the house. It's 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 the guitar made some sort of intervention into the family. There wasn't a guitarist musician in the in the family, uh, like relative and uncle or whatever, or indeed my parents. <clears throat> But the guitar was there, and the music started to appear on the on the television. And we'll say Lonnie Donegan here because I mm. remember going to school, and there was a boy playing the guitar, and uh, he was he was doing some of these Lonnie Donegan songs like Rock Island Line, which of course is Lead Belly. <laughs> I approached him. I said, "Well, that's really really good what you're doing." And I've got one of those at home. And he said, "Bring it along." And I'll tune it up. So this guitar that had been sort of maybe left behind by a previous owner suddenly became, well, as I say, it's an intervention, isn't it? No, I mean, I was thinking to myself that when I heard that you were getting the Kennedy Centre Award that, uh, for, for contributions to American culture, that there was, it, you were coming full circle. It was a bit sort of Coles to Newcastle, because there you were, this British band, completely influenced by blues and early rock and roll, then taking music back to America. I think you're absolutely right, but you see, it's... <clears throat> in so much as realising that Elvis Presley was was um, accessing these blues artists, these country blues artists, let alone Little Richard, who was like the, who was the, well, the songbook really for rock and roll at that point. Um, it was it was fascinating to be able to go back into to his roots. But you're absolutely correct in saying this this was like the British version of something that came out of rockabilly and blues. Uh, it, you know, out of the States in the, in the, well, 50s, but even before. But could Led Zeppelin have existed without American music? Well, no. No. No, because what, what, whatever was kicking off our sort of rock and roll movement over here in the 50s wouldn't have existed without American music, really. So you're going to... So be... we all owe a tremendous debt to it, really, for this whole movement that went on, the, from the Beatles and all the rest of it. It's all American music, apart from the fact that they... Wrote music too, and then you start to take influences later on from 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 world music, introducing you know elements like the the, the, the sitar elements from, from 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 reggae and so on. And I was wondering now, I know that you're working on your on on your own uh, uh, mm. album at the moment. What what sort of areas you're looking at now? Actually, as far as my uh, my teenage years of learning the guitar. I was sort of trying to access anything that, that, that was of six strings, really, to begin with. But because of the stringed instrument, I, I, I guess my tastes were, tastes were even more inquisitive. And so I, I accessed oud playing and uh, et cetera, et cetera. It goes, it goes on the sitar playing. Um, I, I, I think I was really taken by the inter interpretation of musicians to these various instruments. And... And I took it on board, uh, and it was a, it was quite a part of me. So it's quite an eclectic mix. So so the, therefore the, the the intensity of one number will be totally different to another. It's always been part of me, Kirsty. So what whatever I'm going to do next will always will always have all these different moods and shades and colours, because that's that's sort of how I am really, and. Uh, it's got to be a reflection of how you are, I think. So are you still, for instance, um, I mean, I, I, I heard that, that you were sort of working on kind of, you know, found music, um, field recordings. You, can you give us any hints in, in that area, what you're working on at the moment? Um, what I will be working on in the new year, because that's, that's when I intend to be doing it, um, is... Uh, I, well, I can't really tell you, can of I? No, no. Do you know what the whole problem, really, with, with, with sort of saying... I mean, one of the worst things is if you say, well, I'm getting together with this musician, that musician, and another musician, and you're too in, in, in advance of being, any, anybody being able to hear exactly what you're doing. They've already made up their mind of what it's going to sound like, and then they you know, could be invariably disappointed. So at the moment, I can tell you that I'm, I'm still on my own at the moment. I haven't pulled my musicians in, but I will be in the new year. And then we'll see what, we'll see what we should see. So you're in talks. Uh, but I'm, I'm prepared. You're prepared? I'm, oh, yes, I've got a lot of material for this.
And, and can you give us any hints where the material might have come from, the sort of areas it might have come from? Well, it, well, it, well, well I've written it myself, um, but yes, it comes from it, 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 the access point or the inspiration still fits in with this, uh, with, with other cultures. Because you're, you, 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 you're a bit of a musical explorer, aren't you, in that sense? Well, I've li I, I like to think that I have been, yes. Now, when you get your Kennedy Centre medal, you will uh, be introduced to uh, President Obama. Yes. So if you, um, you know, have a little chat with him about American music, how do you think that chat will go? I did an interview for, uh, well, well, I think the members of the band all, all, all did an interview for an, for an American network. And it was said at that point that he'd said that he'd, the music that he listened to was, or had listened to in, in his youth, was Stevie Wonder uh, and Earth, Wind and Fire. But I could, I could understand why he listened to, uh, to Stevie Wonder, because he's an incredible craftsman. Um, I'm, I'm really relieved that we're going there and that he's been re-elected, I must say. It's going to be quite a... Do you know if he was a Led, do you know if President Obama was a Led Zeppelin fan? I don't know. <clears throat> I don't know whether he's been sort of forced to listen to it as we've been <laughs> as we're going, he's going to be hosting this ceremony. Um, I, I really don't know, but that's something that we will find out. somebody who's so, been so influenced in the past by American music, mm. are you in any way excited by what has come out of America in recent years? Yes, I, I, I'm excited because it's fueling a new generation of, uh, of youth. The music that's going on at the moment, uh, the, the music that sort of came from the DJ, DJs and hip-hop, and uh, uh, it, it's really superb. And the, 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 the sort of music that, that inspired me, like um, blues music and the sort of trance music, of, of, of yesteryear that is, uh, that is riff inspired, well you can hear riffs in all of the music now, so it's still, it, it, it's still alive and, uh, and, and kicking, it's just that maybe the guitar may not be at the forefront right now, but that doesn't matter because it, 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 it'll always be there, there's always a, there's always a movement for live music and, and uh, it's alive and well in, in, in clubs and uh, Oh, ah, yeah, that's wonderful. Now, just finally, because we're here today to talk about this, uh, the film of, uh, of the one-off uh, concert and the, and the release mm. of, of, of the record celebration, will it ha happen again? Well, the, the, the fact is that um, uh, the easiest way to put this together is to say that, yeah, we've just recently had um, showings of, of the film and... Um, and the group members have been back together for premieres, etc. Um, and that's a, almost, it's almost five years after the event. Um, and the only way that I can look at this is to, to, to be quite realistic about it and say, well, um, the, the, that, that's quite an amount of time to pass without actually um, uh, um, not a hint or a whisper or a nudge or a wink about maybe doing something for, for, some, for some reason or other. So um, um, I, I, I don't hold a lot of hope in it. Because if it was just up to you and John Paul, you would do it, wouldn't you? Well, how, how do you mean, no? It's Robert Plant who doesn't want to do it. I don't know whether he doesn't want to do it, but, but what I do know is that or, or, or we were aware that he was going to do the Alison Krauss project, uh, and, that, and that was sort of going to follow on from the O2. And so I suppose you, one might have thought, well, uh, let's see what he's going to do after that. And then he did another project, and then another project. There always seemed to be another project coming up, and then we're sort of talking five years later. And, uh, well, we, we hadn't done another concert, so there we are.